This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes covering just about anything you can think of. Be it a course in drawing, design, music production, or entrepreneurship, Skillshare has something for you. And in case you need a recommendation to get yourself started, I'd like to suggest Everyday Minimalism by Aaron Boyle. I think it's safe to say that from time to time we need an overhaul of our living slash workspaces, even if it's just to de-stress. This course will walk you through things step by step, and best of all, it's only about half an hour long. To help you explore your creativity today, Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium membership to the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description box down below. And after that, it's only about 10 bucks a month. Thank you, Skillshare, for once again supporting the channel, and now on to the episode. Welcome to episode three of Stories from Our Disturbing World, the series where we take a tour of the dark side of reality. And in this episode, we look at five real life tales dealing in everything from a tragic family cult, all the way to a case so heinous, it's often mistaken for fiction. As the title suggests, the content of this video is disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. On March 12th, 2004, Fresno police were called to 761 West Hammond Avenue, a residence belonging to one Marcus Wesson and his unusually large family. Initially, this was meant to be a call regarding custody, as several Wesson children were inside the home. Their mothers, yes plural, were attempting to remove them from Marcus's care, or lack thereof, as we'll soon discuss. Marcus at first gave the illusion of being cooperative. He agreed to hand the kids over, but quickly changed course, barricading himself and the entire family inside, only to surrender over an hour and a half later. The thing is, however, by that point it was actually too late. Once police gained access to the home, what they walked in on was absolutely horrifying. Nine bodies were stacked one on top of another in a manner that resembled cordwood, according to one officer who was on the scene. Each victim was one of Marcus's own children, most of which were between the ages of one and eight. They were mortally wounded via gunshot wound to the head, specifically through an eye. Also found in the home were several antique coffins. Now, this was already shocking enough, but it would soon become known to the public that there was much more to the story than meets the eye. Something especially apparent once you learn that most of the murdered children who died that day were born out of incest, parented by Marcus and his own daughters and nieces. As it turns out, what Fresno had on their hands wasn't just a domestic dispute, but an entire reclusive family cult led by a man who believed not only in vampires, but that he himself was a god, something he taught his many children to believe from the day they were born. Marcus D. Wesson was born in Kansas on August 22, 1946, to a strict, abusive father and a religious fanatic mother who brought up her children in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Wessons eventually found themselves relocating, specifically to California, where Marcus would spend the majority of his life, save for a brief deployment overseas during the Vietnam War. Upon Marcus's return to California, he met a married mother by the name of Rosemary Solorio, who would soon leave her life for Marcus, and by 1971, the pair would have their first child together. Rosemary, as mentioned earlier, already had children from her previous marriage. One of them, Elizabeth, became the center of fixation for Marcus. Years earlier, when Elizabeth was just eight years old, Marcus announced that she was to be his bride, something he claimed was made clear by God himself. The two, of course, couldn't legally wed, but Marcus was content to have a home wedding. Rosemary, meanwhile, allowed for this to happen to her child, even telling her it was okay. This was when the sexual abuse started, and by 1974, 15-year-old Elizabeth was due to have her first child with Marcus, age 28. Once the two were finally able to legally marry, Rosemary would fade into the background, and from this point on, Elizabeth would be used by Marcus as a means to produce as many children as possible. Over the next decade or so, Elizabeth would give birth a staggering 11 times. Elizabeth would later tell reporters that none of this bothered her at the time. She believed everything Marcus said about their union, God, and life itself. She noted that since she was raised with the man, she had no way to know that what he was teaching her, and eventually their many children, was actually his own perverted brand of religion that no one else practiced. 
As you may have gathered, Marcus's beliefs were bizarre, to say the very least. Although he was brought up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, his personal beliefs would begin to mutate at a young age. As a teen, he began to speak of polygamy, something not traditionally practiced at his church, and perhaps most puzzlingly, he adopted the belief that Jesus Christ was actually a vampire, a belief stemming from his interpretation of what it meant to partake in the blood and flesh of Christ in order to achieve immortality. As expected, much like his mother, Marcus was a fanatic and made sure to teach his children his ways, even going as far as to handwrite his own Bible, readings of which were commonplace in the Wesson household, and of course, as most fanatics tend to be, Marcus was strict. His Bible was to be obeyed without fail, and those who didn't comply were subject to harsh physical abuse that could come at any time without any warning. To make matters even worse, Marcus wasn't just preaching to his family, but also claiming that he himself was actually a prophet, that he was able to speak to God directly, and that he knew the ultimate truth. And his family, isolated from the outside world, believed him, feared him. Marcus could do no wrong in their eyes, since his will was the will of God. Eventually, this goalpost would shift, and Marcus basically became God. Anything outside the Wesson household was demonized, portrayed as evil and corrupt. According to Marcus, the government was not to be trusted, and in later testimony, his surviving relatives would tell tales of the many times they were made to watch clips of the infamous Waco incident. Marcus oftentimes praising David Koresh for not letting the government break up his sect without a fight. He made it clear that if the government was so inclined to do the same thing to the Wessons, they would have to be ready. Abuse and cult-like authoritarianism weren't the only things that plagued the Wessons. Marcus, in general, was not the best at holding jobs. In fact, after his relationship with young Elizabeth officially began and his time under Rosemary's roof ended, the two relocated to Marcus's mother's home. Rather than financially supporting himself and his new wife and child, Marcus depended on his mother, who eventually kicked the couple out. After a brief stint as a bank teller, Marcus had had enough. He began depending on welfare checks, and as such, the family was more often than not suffering from extreme poverty. The sheer number of mouths to feed growing every year, worsening the situation. At some points, the children were forced to eat from dumpsters, while Marcus, on the other hand, found ways to avoid this. The family was also forced to keep moving around depending on the situation, making do wherever they could manage, at one point on board an ill-sized boat and another time on a bus. Eventually, the Wessons would find themselves within close proximity to Elizabeth's siblings, the same bunch that Marcus was actually once raising alongside Rosemary. Now they were adults with children of their own, children who were Elizabeth's nieces and nephews and Marcus's by marriage. Soon, Marcus was indoctrinating them into his personal church. They too were put under his control and eventually his guardianship. That is, until their mothers had had enough, tried to take them back, and we all know how that story ends. It should come as no surprise that Marcus soon began molesting his nieces just as he once did to Elizabeth when she was a child. According to him, this was normal, something that he had to do to teach the girls how to please a man. By the mid-1990s, Elizabeth hadn't given birth in several years for whatever reason, and Marcus began setting his sights on what he saw as the next best thing, his own daughters and nieces. Soon enough, they too would bear his children, convinced that this was the right thing to do after a lifetime of brainwashing. The story of the Wesson family is long and complicated, and there's still a lot left to be said. As mentioned earlier, Marcus had it in his head that going out like Waco was favorable to having the government take his family away, and once the authorities came knocking, this ultimately resulted in the demise of nine innocent individuals who suffered a lifetime of abuse at his hands. In 2005, Marcus was convicted of first-degree murder and sexual assault, resulting in his being sentenced to death. Given how these things go, however, Marcus, now in his 70s, is much more likely to die of old age. It goes without saying that true justice will never actually be served here, no matter what happens to Marcus. Keep in mind, there are quite a few surviving members of the Wesson family, and they, at the end of the day, tragically have to live with the overwhelming amount of pain caused by this one man. 
While many of us use cameras solely for entertainment, there are millions out there who also use them for more practical reasons, like to help ease the stress of parenting. Baby monitors, for example, provide a helping hand in keeping an eye on the little one while you've got your hands full in another room. In some cases, however, parents can find themselves in a paradoxical mess. What happens when something made to ensure your child's safety is then used to potentially cause them harm? This was the case for the LeMay family in 2019, just a few days following the installation of a Ring security camera in the children's shared bedroom. This is what happened. Who is that? I'm your best friend! I'm Santa Claus! I'm, I'm Santa Claus! Don't you want to be my best friend? I don't know who you are. I'm I Santa Claus! As you can see here, just one of the LeMay children is present. She's scared, alone, and has no idea how to deal with the strange voice that's now speaking to her via the security cam's built-in speakers. According to news reports, this harassment lasts a total of around five minutes before the little girl cries out to her mom, who's elsewhere in the house at that moment. Before things stop, however, the girl is not only taunted, but she's also encouraged to destroy her room. You can mess up your room, you can break your TV, you can do whatever you want. The man even goes out of his way to scare the child by playing Tiny Tim's Tiptoe Through the Tulips, a song many consider scary. If you look up stories about this clip online, tons of people question the use of a camera in a children's room. As stated earlier, many parents use baby monitors in nurseries, and generally speaking, that's the societal norm, but many find it weird or even creepy that a camera was even installed here to begin with, given that the kids are a bit older. The thing is, this mother, like many, actually has a very real and valid reason for doing so. As it turns out, one of the other children not seen here suffers from a medical condition and having a camera allows for easier monitoring and documentation if something does go wrong. Other parents are also known to keep security cameras indoors to monitor their children when, let's say, they're at work and they have a babysitter present. As for the man who hacked the webcam, based on how he sounds and what he did, it's pretty easy to determine that this is just a garden variety troll, but nonetheless, it doesn't make what he did acceptable or any less harmful. We all know that this world is full of creeps, and while this one was out to make himself known, there are many out there who would have watched silently, not letting anyone in on the fact that they're being watched. By that point, who knows what could have happened. What these silent voyeurs could see you or your children doing. For all we know, the man who hacked the LeMay's security camera could have just as easily been a child predator. These days, it's easier than ever to set up a home security system, and while it's definitely not a bad idea on paper, issues begin to unearth themselves when this technology finds itself in the hands of those who just aren't tech-savvy. The people who don't fully understand how these things work, and as such, ironically, haven't set up proper safety precautions to protect the devices meant to protect them. To make matters even worse here, as we all know, it isn't just security cameras that are at risk. These days, our entire lives depend on electronic devices in general, but even if we just narrow it down to cameras, they're still everywhere. Our phones, computers, and even our TVs now come with built-in cameras, and there's no telling how many people are out to exploit this for their own gain. These technologies, of course, are extremely important in our everyday lives, be it for keeping us safe or keeping us connected, but without proper education and awareness, these tools will unfortunately continue to be exploited. It's a day just like any other at Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom. The sun is out, the weather is perfect, and most importantly, people are having a great time. Amongst the many attendees that day was a young, 13-year-old girl by the name of Caitlin Lassiter and her two friends. For the trio, the day was still young. In fact, they basically just arrived at the amusement park. 
The first attraction they decided to ride was called Superman Tower of Power. It's a type of ride that most of us are familiar with. One that lifts riders up to nauseating heights, pauses, and then leads to a terrifying yet exhilarating freefall. Before you know it, it's all over, and while most of us will ride these without incident, the same unfortunately can't be said for young Caitlin. What happened next would change her life forever. Caitlin and her friends had just finished their first ride aboard the Tower of Power. There wasn't much of a line, so the girls were allowed a second go without even having to disembark, something that most of us would have probably decided to do ourselves if given the opportunity. For the first few seconds, things seemed to be going as usual. The passenger cars were slowly ascending as they should. Caitlin and her friends were laughing, having a great time just as they did moments earlier. But then things took a very sudden and terrifying turn for the worst. The girls felt a sudden jolt followed by a loud whipping sound. Before they knew it, they were covered in cables. Now, by this point, they weren't all that far off the ground. Based on different testimonies, at this point, the passenger cars were only about 30 to 40 feet off the floor. And keep in mind, this ride was over 100 feet tall. Caitlin and her friends began screaming as hard as they could, begging for the ride to be stopped, but it kept going. The girls managed to get most of the wiring off of them, but there was only so much they could do, and soon enough, they reached the summit. The ride dropped, just as it was supposed to. The girls fell just as they did the first time, and stopped at the bottom as the machine is designed to do. Only, Caitlin, this time, was not okay. Both of her feet were completely severed by the broken cables. Now, to most of us, this probably sounds like a freak accident, something that happened out of nowhere that was no one's fault, but that's actually not the case. According to reports, the ride operators working that day were both under the age of 18, and whether it be due to lack of training or whatever else, they simply didn't do what they could to prevent this tragedy. In incident reports, it states that the ride operators did in fact notice the snapping noise, the broken cables, they even heard screaming that they categorized as unusual even for a thrill ride. It's important to note that this was also true of the main operator who was standing in front of the emergency brake button. For whatever reason, they decided to call the park emergency line to ask what to do instead of immediately stopping the ride. Of course, the call took up precious time. Time that was not at all to be wasted given the severity of the situation. Meanwhile, the assistant ride operator, who based on the descriptions wasn't at the control panel, yelled over to the main operator to hit the emergency brake. Which finally they did, but it was too late. The ride had begun its freefall and Caitlin would be severely injured and mentally traumatized for the rest of her life. Caitlin thankfully survived the ordeal, and her friends for the most part only experienced minor physical injuries. Both of her missing feet were recovered, and one luckily was able to be reattached. But as for the other leg, the injuries were so severe that doctors actually had to amputate below the knee. Just a year after the incident, a now 14-year-old Caitlin could be seen speaking publicly regarding the issue of safety and oversight at amusement parks. Ultimately, the official explanation for what happened was that the cable snapped due to fatigue, something that supposedly could have been detected had a newer version of the ride manual been referenced. At the end of the day, what we have here is a deadly mix of incompetence and negligence. People not doing their jobs when doing their jobs could mean the difference between life and death for innocent individuals. And while events like these aren't necessarily common, what happened to Caitlin is still horrifying and had these people cared, she absolutely would still have both of her legs today and been spared from permanent physical and mental trauma. It goes without saying that we as human beings have the right to live our lives however we see fit. We choose what we do, where we go, when we do things, and who we talk to. It's so embedded into our daily lives that most of us could barely imagine living without this freedom. That being said, we also make mistakes. Some more costly than others, and one innocent misstep could lead us down a path of no return. This, unfortunately, was the case for 20-year-old single mother Amber Alyssa Takaro, an indigenous woman from Alberta, Canada, whose murder, to this day, 
remains unsolved. Amber had a close relationship with her mother, Vivian, who described her as strong-willed, a tough woman who wouldn't let anyone mess with her. On the surface, everything in Amber's life seemed well and that nothing could really go wrong for her, but that all would unfortunately change in late 2010. August 17th. Amber, who lived in Fort McMurray, decides to take a weekend trip to Edmonton with her then 14-month-old son and a female friend. Instead of staying directly in Edmonton, the pair booked a stay in nearby Nisku, a much cheaper alternative. After arriving, Amber was ready to see the city, eagerly leaving the motel around 7 or 8 p.m. while her son and friend stayed behind. The trip into the city that night was presumably supposed to be brief, maybe just a couple hours of sightseeing and then back to the motel, but this unfortunately was the last time anyone would ever see Amber alive. Again, the women didn't have a ton of money at their disposal and made do with what they could for their trip. Amber, looking to save money, decided to hitchhike her way into Edmonton instead of calling a cab, a decision that at first seemed harmless but would ultimately turn grim. The young mother was picked up by a man, and what you're about to hear next is a short snippet of audio recorded while she was in his car. Where are we by? We're just heading south of uh, Beaumont, or north of Beaumont. We're heading north of Beaumont. Yo, where are we going? Just... No, this is a... Are you f***ing kidding me? You better not take... You better not take me anywhere I don't want to go. I want to go into the city. Okay. Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? No, we're not. Then where the are these roads going to? 50th Street. 50th Street. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yo, where are we going? 50th Street. 50th Street? 50th Street. East, right? East. <laughs> over Problem. Problem. According to Amber's mother, she'd been in constant contact with her daughter that night and got extremely worried when she stopped responding. Amber was reported missing the next morning, but authorities had written it off as just another young person out partying and thus didn't give it too much attention. This despite the fact that she was a young woman who failed to reappear after getting into a car with a complete stranger at night. Days passed without Amber's return, and authorities still fell short, even prematurely removing Amber from the missing person's registry after just a month. Now, in case that wasn't bad enough, for some unknown reason, it took investigators four whole months before they even interviewed Amber's family, something that many consider to be due to Amber's ethnic background. Two whole years into the case, authorities finally released the audio clip you just heard in the hopes that someone would recognize the male voice and come forward. Unfortunately, however, everyone was soon going to find out what came after the abrupt ending heard at the end of the call. September 1st, 2012. Coincidentally, just four days after the call was released, two horseback riders found partial skeletal remains which would soon be ID'd as Amber. Interestingly enough, her remains were found south of her motel, which was actually in the exact opposite direction of where she wanted to go. And on top of that, they were found 17 minutes away, which is the same amount of time the full phone call lasted, prompting theories that Amber's life ended shortly after the phone call. It's pretty clear in the audio that Amber was nervous, repeating information that she was receiving, asking where they were, and even threatening the unknown man. It was at this point where Amber's situation started spiraling out of control. There wasn't anything that she could do to get herself out of the situation, given that she was in a moving vehicle in an unfamiliar area. Overall, the story is very tragic, from a heartbroken mother who lost her only daughter, a son who has to grow up without his mother, to the horrible mishandling of the situation from local authorities. To this day, Vivian Takaro still seeks justice for what happened to her daughter, and while the authorities have publicly apologized for the mishandling of the case, Vivian still wants to find whoever did this to her daughter. 
Countless individuals have come forward saying that they recognize the voice, but they've yet to find the man behind the murder. Vivian still believes that someone out there has to know exactly who the voice belongs to, and she hopes that one day that person will come forward and something will finally come out of it. The story you're about to hear is one that's only really mentioned in passing on the English side of the internet, a tale that most have at least heard of but can't really place. In fact, a good number of people actually mistake this for viral fiction or even a creepypasta. What I'm referring to is a case that's been dubbed the Hello Kitty murder, and yes, it really did happen. To be more precise, based on what happened in court, this might be more accurately called the Hello Kitty torture, but more on that later. First, let's discuss what happened. Hong Kong, 1999. In many ways, it's easy to see how this story could be mistaken for fiction. For one, it begins with a fairly bizarre scene. A young girl, about 13 years of age, is at a police station claiming to be haunted by an angry spirit that's been visiting her in her dreams. While at first it's unclear what the police can even do about this, the more the girl speaks, the darker things become. She told police that the ghost was that of a woman she'd not only help kill, but also torture. According to her, this wasn't for a matter of hours or even a day or two, but for an entire month. To prove her story, the girl led police to an apartment building on Granville Road, where they discovered a gruesome scene. The unit was dilapidated, giving off a gag-worthy stench, one that would be familiar to anyone who's ever been near a rotting corpse. Within sight was a large, heavily stained Hello Kitty doll, and sewn into the doll, specifically its head, was a human skull. While most of the skull's tissue was gone, bits of flesh and ligaments still remained, making it clear that this was relatively fresh. On top of this, other body parts were also recovered, but not as many as authorities had hoped. A bag of organs and a stray tooth had been found, but the rest of the body was never recovered. And here's why. Fan Man Yi was a married 23-year-old mother and hostess who led an unfortunately troubled life. Her early days were reportedly not easy, as she was an orphan and had to resort to making money however she could. Eventually, this would lead to her crossing paths with local gang members, one of which was a man by the name of Chan Man Lo. Fan eventually found herself in debt, as most of us do at some point in life, and to help pay this off, she allegedly stole Chan's wallet, which at the time contained several thousand dollars. The thing is, Chan, unsurprisingly, in addition to being a drug dealer and pimp, was also a loan shark. So whether Fan Mani really stole his wallet or simply took it out as a loan is unclear. Either way, it's said that Fan actually did in fact pay back the initial debt, but as these things go, Chan kept asking for more in the form of bogus interest and other nonsense to keep the already poor mother paying up. Eventually, for whatever reason, Fan stopped paying up and she stopped answering Chan's phone calls. It's now March 1999. Chan has instructed two of his underlings to forcibly take Fan from her home, and that's exactly what they did. They took her to an apartment building on Granville Road. The initial plan here was actually for Fan to be forced into prostitution until she paid off whatever so-called debt that she still had. Chan's two henchmen resided in the apartment, and so did the 13-year-old girl, who was apparently dating one of these men, who, keep in mind, were in their 30s. The gang members wasted no time, beating Fan repeatedly on the first night of her captivity, screaming at her, asking where the money was and why she wasn't picking up her phone. For whatever reason, whether it be due to the meth the men were taking or out of sheer cruelty, the physical abuse began to escalate at an extremely alarming rate. Here are some of the things reported to the courts by the 13-year-old who was granted immunity for her testimony. According to her, the two men began to burn the woman with lighters, then rubbed chili pepper oil or other condiments into her wounds. While Fawn was held down, molten plastic was dripped onto her feet, causing severe burns and blisters, the men demanding that she either laugh or smile while this happened, lest she be subjected to more. On several occasions, Fawn was reportedly forced to consume various substances such as urine, large amounts of cooking oil, and at one point, even the 13-year-old's excrement. 
Wires were used to hang Fawn in an upright position, which she was kept in for hours on end, including times where she'd be struck with metal pipes, wooden sticks, or whatever else the men felt like using. It may be shocking, but this isn't even the end of it. And while there is a lot more, I think I've gotten my point across. Fawn was subjected to unspeakable cruelty, and given the severity, I think most of us aren't surprised that she ultimately passed away. Now, I do want to point out that the 13-year-old girl in question admitted, albeit with remorse, that she willingly participated in Fawn's torture and wasn't simply a spectator. It goes without saying that this guilt contributed to her turning herself in and reporting the two adult men who were also involved. At the start of the story, I mentioned a legal contention with this tale's nickname, the Hello Kitty Murder. Once this case went to court, the men responsible for Fawn's kidnapping, torture, and death were ultimately charged with manslaughter, the logic being that while their acts were heinous and unforgivable, they never intended to kill the woman, or at least there wasn't enough evidence to prove so. What exactly killed Fawn is actually unknown, this being due to the lack of a body to autopsy. After Fawn was found dead by the 13-year-old girl, the two men dismembered her in the bathtub, cooked most of her body in an attempt to mask the smell of rot, then successfully discarded most of the remains in the trash. Again, no one knows for sure if these men willingly inflicted the final blow that ultimately killed Fawn, or if she died due to her injuries, which is most likely the case, but either way, the men responsible have been put in jail and were given life sentences. Legally, this is justice, but nothing will bring Fawn back. Nothing will change the suffering she endured in her final month of life, and nothing will bring her back to her only son who has to grow up without his mother. All over a few thousand dollars. These were five stories from our very own disturbing world, real-life tales that remind us that true horror lurks just around the corner, even in everyday life. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing as there will definitely be more. But in the meantime, check out other episodes in the series, and if you have a story that you'd like to see make an appearance on the show, feel free to drop me a line at rainbotinbox at gmail.com. This video would not be possible without the help of my supporters on Patreon, but especially the following people. T. Gorman, Connor H., Andrew L., Daniel G., Shadow, Joel H., Guillermo M., Eric H., Lance, Esper Nix, Nick B., Krista S., Keith Z., Benjamin M., Scorian S., Amelia J., Michael R., Bloody the Elf, Luck B., Anthony M., Jeremy R., S. Estrada, Zarai, Aaron V., Borealis Knight, Phoenix, Ruben M., Tracy T., Isaac M., Matt J., Val C., Tyler T., Astro, Jake J., Pixelwing, Luke S., and Nero592. Thank you so much for the support, and thank you for watching, and I'll see you all next time.